Um, I would like to thank everyone for joining us today. Uh, as you may or may not know, this is our very first presentation of the DNC Speaker Series, Advances in Prevention Science, Diversity and Inclusion. Uh, and for those of you that are, that are new to our group, uh, the DNC is a diversity network committee, which is a part of the Society for Prevention and Research. So uh, since this is our, our first presentation in the speaker series, I just kind of briefly lay out the aims of the presentation series, which are to highlight research and prevention science that is led by researchers from underrepresented groups and primarily conduct research with groups that are understudied. The presentation series also aims to create a forum for our guest speakers to share career professional reflections as a researcher from an underrepresented group or groups. The, the, this second aim is intended to promote discussions of diversity and inclusion in professions related to prevention science and public health. Uh, also, before we get started, I would like to thank the following uh, people for helping out uh, in preparation for this presentation. Uh, my co-chair, Nicole Tewitt, Jennifer Lewis, Amanda Sickleman Borgia, Albert Delgado, and of course, our guest speaker, Dr. Renee Johnson. And then also as a reminder, please join us again in June as we celebrate Pride Month. And with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to Dr. Tewitt. Hello, I'm um, Nicole Tewitt, and I'm excited to introduce our very first speaker of the DNC Speaker Series. Um, she's made great contributions to the fields of epidemiology and prevention science, both as a researcher and mentor to aspiring epidemiology and public health students and early career professionals. She's an associate professor in the Department of Mental Health at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, and her research focuses on substance use and violence among marginalized populations, including people of color, trauma-exposed youth, immigrants, and low-income youth in urban areas. Uh, so I would like to introduce Dr. Renee Johnson. Thank you, Renee. Hi, everyone. I will go ahead and uh, share my screen and get started. Um, hide video. Okay. Um, so I actually can't see the chat box. So Nicole, do let me know if somebody uh, jumps in. Um, uh, I am really happy to be uh, here giving this talk to you all and what a treat to be the first one in this series. Uh, before getting started, I wanted to give a land acknowledgement. I'm giving this talk from Baltimore City on land stolen from the Piscataway people through the direct and indirect violence of settler societies, colonialism, and genocide, historical processes of dispossession, which are ongoing. Baltimore City is also a place where predominantly Black communities have been disproportionately impacted by discriminatory housing policies, economic disinvestment, inequitable development and residential displacement. So um, here are some of your early members of SPR. And uh, I, I highlight this picture to say, this was the face of prevention science as I was entering the field. It's not the 60s, it's not the 50s, it's the 90s. Um, it was a, a field with limited diversity with respect to gender, race, ethnicity, and probably many other aspects. So I think it's really inspiring and admirable um, of the DNC and SPR more broadly to really commit to developing an organization that values diversity, equity, and inclusion. So I was asked to talk about um, overview of my research portfolio, why I chose the career I chose, um, to describe my experience and journey of getting to where I am and you know, offer any insights I have for other scholars of color. Um, and I haven't really given a talk like this, so I'm going to do my best. <clears throat> and But it may be a little meandering. And I will be talking to Black scholars, other scholars of color, and also um, first-gen scholars, queer scholars, and people who are otherwise minoritized. Um, but I do hope it resonates with all of you. So just a little bit about you know, where I came from. Um, I graduated from high school in 1992 from Abington Senior High School. Fun fact, Bob Saget was in my graduating class. Um, and uh, my family has been in the United States at least since the mid 1800s. Um, my family was in the Glen Camp Plantation in South Carolina near Charleston. <clears throat> 
after World War II, um, my uh, great-great-grandfather moved to suburban Philadelphia, Willow Grove specifically, and built a home for himself. And that was actually the home that I was born in. I attended Abington schools where my mother and grandmother before her had gone. Um, my grandmother, uh, schools in that uh, township had integrated uh, by the time my mother was in elementary school in the 20s. So my father was from Philadelphia and he didn't see the suburbs until the first time in the 70s when he was going to college at Penn State Abington, one of the satellite sites for Penn State. And um, he was just mesmerized by how big the schools were and how much green space there was. He grew up poor in Philadelphia in a row house. Um, so one thing he knew was that he wanted to raise his kids um, in a place like Abington. <clears throat> uh, so my father is a really important part of my story. He's incredibly smart, um, but he was always discouraged from getting an education. His counselor in high school said he just simply wasn't smart enough for college. He went to college anyway. Um, his counselors at college said that he uh, wasn't smart enough to be a doctor because he thought maybe I'll be pre-med. Um, so he went on to major in engineering. And I find that story very emblematic of my father because he's so literal that he really thought, oh, I can't be a doctor. I guess I'll be an engineer. Um, it's, it's very much his personality. He went on to be one of the first black engineers at Philadelphia Electric Company in Philadelphia and experienced relentless workplace bullying, racism, and harassment his entire career. Um, we received prank calls regularly. He was called the N-word. He was sent nasty notes. This was his work life um, from the time he got his first job in the early 70s until he retired. <clears throat> um, because of his experiences with uh, you know, work, and education, he was determined that his children wouldn't go to uh, go through the same things. Um, and he always affirmed our intelligence. He, he told me all the time, you're the smartest person in your class. Don't ever let anyone tell you that you're not smart. Um, and I think this is uh, something that black parents do to um, help their kids get through the ag aggressive educational environments that they experience. One thing he did was make sure we had black counselors. I was in a predominantly white high school with one counselor, and he said, that's the counselor my kids uh, need to have. So he really didn't want to have anybody discourage us. And um, he took that seriously, and I take that seriously as well. I know that I'm the only black professor many of my students will ever have, including many of my uh, black students. Um, and other minoritized students. And so I take that role seriously and I um, really try to encourage people, remind them they didn't, we didn't make a mistake in admitting you that you have a bright future ahead. And I think those of you who are working with students, we need to remember to do this. We're good at humbling um, students uh, in our educational programs. And I think we need to be a little bit better at encouraging people and reminding them just how um, much the field needs them. Um, so um, related again to my father, I wanted to major in sociology. And my father being an engineer just was like, but what does that mean? What's your job? There's not a job called sociologist. So being in Atlanta, I uh, found the field of public health and that was a profession and that made sense to him. Like, what job can you get? I could work at CDC. Um, so I took some undergraduate coursework in public health at Morehouse uh, College, and Bill Jenkins was my first professor of public health. Uh, Bill Jenkins is a name that I hope you all know, and if you don't, I hope you'll look into him after that. Um, he was the whistleblower for the Tuskegee syphilis study. Um, he worked at CDC. He was one of the first black statisticians at um, the National Vital Statistics Survey, and he just trained a generation of scholars in public health. Um, so he taught me my first public health class. He just died last year, so it's very sad. He taught me my first public health 
uh, class. And one thing that he said was that there are only three black epidemiologists at CDC at any given time. Now remember, this is the 90s. This is not the 60s. This is very recent history. Um, and he always stressed the importance of having black people in public health. He was a graduate of UNC and being the rule following person that I was, I said, well, then I should probably go to UNC like Bill told me to. Um, when I was a rising senior at Spelman, I applied for the UNC Summer Pre-Graduate Research Experiences Program. And um, unfortunately, I did not get in, but I begged to go and um, not be paid. And the director of that program accepted me and I got this great mentor, a woman named Carol Runyon, and she managed the UNC Injury Prevention Research Center. Um, and I went on to work with her for the next 10 years. Carol was an incredibly supportive mentor um, in all respects. And she remains one of my um, biggest cheerleaders and mentor. She um, absolutely critiques my work and my thinking, um, but also uh, encourages me. And I've just learned so much from her. Um, so part of why I wanted to talk about SPGRE was because it was a pipeline project. It really changed the direction of um, my graduate studies. I, I don't know that I would have been able to go on to UNC in a master's program without having gotten to know um, folks at UNC the summer before that. So I say that to stress the importance of participating in these pipeline programs. It is really difficult and it's not incentivized for professors to have summer students, but it really does make the difference. Like you're, you can't sit back and expect the pipeline to reflect the actual population of the United States. We have to work to get it there. Um, and, and this is one of those things. So um, while I was uh, working with Carol that summer, I abstracted data from uh, death certificates in the office of the medical examiner. Um, and what I was doing was putting things into an Excel, Excel spreadsheet the idea was that we wanted to find out some basic descriptive statistics about children who had uh, died and their cause of death was homicide. That work would eventually be used to um, advocate for uh, child fatality death reviews, which are in all 50 states now. And what child fatality death reviews do is look at um, death circumstances for children around um, uh, and, and just see where were the service gaps? Like, what, you know, how do we prevent these from happening? They also have domestic violence fatality reviews now and opioid fatality reviews. So it's really now a way to do public health, to identify the circumstances of someone's death and um, address it via services. So I went on to um, University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, uh, studied my, um, for an MPH and then a uh, PhD. And at the MPH level, I studied health behavior. And um, as a PhD student, I studied both health behavior and epidemiology. Um, and throughout my doctoral work, I studied injury and violence um, in all of its different forms and focused a, a lot on firearm, um, firearms as a threat to public health. Um, and then in 2004, I went to Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health as a uh, postdoc and worked at the Harvard Youth Violence Prevention Center. So I have expertise in social science, epidemiology, and public health, and my research is broadly centered on understanding and addressing behavioral health of adolescents and emerging adults. I'm particularly interested in vulnerable youth, including low-income youth, urban youth, LGBT youth, uh, immigrants, racial and ethnic minorities, and youth who have been exposed to trauma and violence. Um, as I mentioned before, I have a strong background in injury and violence. I've studied suicide, firearm injury, child maltreatment, family violence, interpersonal violence, including fighting, uh, dating violence, and assault. Um, but most people today know me as a substance use epidemiology and are, in fact, probably wondering um, how I am talking about all this injury stuff. 
Um, and that's because I really changed the direction of my research around 2010. Um, with the help of Dr. Deborah Furholden and Nick Iolongo, I was awarded a Career Development Award from NIDA in 2010. And um, there were a lot of reasons why I applied for that award. Uh, but one was that there wasn't a ton of funding uh, in youth violence research, and I didn't uh, know how to build a career in it. So I thought putting um, uh, substance use epi, epi onto this would um, allow me to you know, be in a more fundable field. And I really learned a lot and it rounded out what I understand about injury and violence. So, you know, just focusing on injury and violence, um, I was missing part of the picture. So now I feel like I'm a much better person to understand the breadth of public health issues among adolescents and emerging adults, given my familiarity with injury and violence and substance use. Um, so I study all of the drugs of, of abuse, um, and my focus has been marijuana um, or cannabis. So the again, I'm going back to the purpose of this talk. Why did you choose the career uh, you chose and your research focus? Um, and I'd say I chose it because I was interested. I was I'm a social scientist at heart, um, but I was committed to studying a topic that would result in a job and that would result in social change. So not basic social science, but applied social science. I also really like that public health enabled um, me to use many different disciplines. So math, social science, natural sciences history, etc. I was at a liberal arts college, and I believe in liberal arts um, education and the way that I could apply all of the different things I was learning um, to a field were very appealing to me. Um, also, I just, I think I got here, I know I got here because of early exposure to incredibly supportive mentors, through pipeline programs. I mentioned SBGRE, but there were many others. Um, and I was also exposed to public health early. Many of my colleagues who didn't go to college in Atlanta, who didn't have people from CDC coming you know, to give talks at their undergraduate institutions, didn't realize what public health was until later in their careers. So I was really lucky. And that um, underscores to me the importance of us letting, getting people um, to know what public health is. I think COVID has sort of done that very quickly, um, but it remains a task. We don't want people to not know what public health is until they're applying to public health uh, PhD programs. Um, and I think I was also um, somebody who tended to get immersed in a field of study and then become fascinated by it and committed to doing research on it, like whatever it was that I was studying. I, was studying cheerleading injuries, which sounds kind of like boring when you think about it, but it was fascinating to me that, you know, they were building these three person period pyramids and then would have catastrophic injuries and um, broken backs and things and that simple policies at the state and schools levels could really change that. Um, so it was, it was fascinating. Um, so I sort of loved thinking about violence and all of many solutions to violence. And I still love thinking about um, substance use epidemiology and where we're going with that. And I'll talk a little bit more about some of my lessons in substance use epidemiology as well. Um, and then the final thing that sort of shaped my um, research focus is pragmatic decision making about topics that were of interest to NIH. And I um, I don't say that lightly. I, I probably would have kept going with violence research and never, you know, applied for a substance use grant if I hadn't um, needed uh, an, another opportunity for funding. And I just grew so much as a scholar by doing that. So it's important. Sometimes we just say, oh, we have to chase the money and NIH only funds X, Y, and Z. But sometimes that, that works out to your benefit. Um, just saying. Okay, so I am going to um, uh, transition, but what I wanted to do first, which is see if there's anything in the chat, if anybody looks like 
Nothing. Okay. Um, so I will just keep keep on going. Um, so I was going to end with um, advice, but before that, I wanted to just talk about some of the research on adolescent marijuana use that I've done and, and lessons learned. So I've been really deep in the weeds of um, cannabis research over the past 10 years. And um, here are like what I would say are my main take home um, lessons. One is it's important to take a historical perspective. I find that people tend to think, you know, um, drug use is going up and up and up and up. And especially with all the passage of uh, marijuana policies that it's certainly going up. But when you look at the long-term data, that's just not the case. And I think it's important that we get that out there so that the general public doesn't just have a better sense of how marijuana use has changed over the years. It was highest in the late 70s, and it's never gotten that high again. About 75% of high school seniors um, reported lifetime use of uh, cannabis in, in the late 70s, and it's, it's more like 40% now. <clears throat> Two, to add even more complexity, is, is it's going down. Overall, there have been uh, declines since the early 90s. Um, though declines in cigarette smoking and alcohol use have been much steeper and much more dramatic. Um, and I, I think I'm preaching to the choir here. This is likely due to alcohol and tobacco control policy. There has just been so much work, especially done by this organization, to really change um, underage alcohol and tobacco use. And that has made a difference. We have really engineered um, drugs out of the lives of young people. I think much more than would have ever been considered um, possible back in the mid 80s. Three, I think it's important to look at sex differences. I, I, people tend to control for sex, but there, there's a story to be told in sex differences. And one story regarding drug use is that there's a narrowing of the gender gap over time. And this is particularly true among Black adolescents. So for most drugs of abuse, um, boys have a higher prevalence of use. Girls have a lower prevalence of use. That gap, gender gap was particularly high among uh, black boys and girls and now has um, narrowed. Um, one finding that I am you know, observing right now is that there is no sex differences in non-medical use of opioids. Um, and I sort of wonder why that is. I, I think that's telling us that when there's a drug out there that uh, girls can use and it doesn't, um, it's got a different story around it. It's not like heroin. There's definitely a gender gap in heroin, but I think pills are something that we see women use in media a lot. I think it's a way that girls can engage in a, a, a get their, needs for psychoactive drug met um, without uh, feeling like they're engaging in a deviant behavior. Um, but I think it's also quite dangerous. So that's something we need to think about. Um, over time, I've also really started to get attuned to developmental differences. There's a big difference between early adolescence, mid to late adolescence, and emerging adults. Um, we see this in marijuana use. Use among early adolescents is declining the fastest, um, whereas use among mid to late adolescents is declining more slowly um, and among emerging adults is increasing. I think we have to think more about emerging adults. Uh, folks were so concerned about increases in marijuana use that they um, sort of forgot about emerging adults. And what happened is that there weren't increases among early adolescents or mid to late adolescents, but there are um, increases among emerging adults. And there's lots of reasons for that, but there's also reasons to be concerned about that, particularly when you think about the social and economic context of emerging adulthood today. The economy simply doesn't work for emerging adults like it did for my father's generation. My father spent $200 on college a semester. Um, young people in the 50s and 60s could afford to eat and get an apartment, maybe even have a really cheap car. 
Um, and those things are just not possible for emerging adult folks, um, for emerging adults these days. And combining um, these political economic forces with a bleak outlook and substance use is, is a dangerous combination and one that I think we need to think about. <clears throat> I've also looked a lot about the uh, differences in marijuana use and drug use more broadly across race and ethnic groups. And uh, one thing that I've observed is that declines in marijuana use have been less steep among Black and Latinx use, youth. Um, and also that Asian youth consistently have lower rates of use. Um, and I think that let's focus on Asian uh, folks first. That is a reason that a lot of people give for just you know not focusing on Asian uh, young people at all. And I think that's a mistake. I've done research where I've looked at different Asian nationalities and the, there's a lot of uh, heterogeneity. Um, so I think even though overall um, Asian young people tend to have lower levels of drug use and uh, violence for that matter, um, means that we should uh, look deeper, not, not ignore that picture. Um, but declines have been less steep among Black and Latinx youth, and I am not sure about the reason for that. And it, you know, it may be that the changing legality um, makes it more appealing or less not appealing. Um, it may relate to age differences. So maybe um, their Black and Latinx youth are older than their same grade peers and that's um, look, uh, manifesting this difference. I think that's certainly the case for um, Latinx youth. And um, it could be the gender gap. So the increases in uh, girls, uh, Black girls substance use may be making that decline look slower. Um, black girls in the 80s and 90s had such low levels of um, drug use and smoking in particular that the CDC did focus groups to find out why. And so I think there's a lot going on, um, but it's important to um, look at different groups, look at the epidemiology of different groups. Um, legalization doesn't make kids use. And I feel like I can't say this enough. People really expected that, you know, we'd pass medical marijuana or pass retail marijuana and then everybody would be using. And that's just not the case. And if you think about adolescent culture, it makes sense that it's not the case. Adolescents have more access to marijuana than any of us adults. All they have to do is go to high school and sell some, and find someone who's selling weed. As adults within a you know prohibition framework, we've got to find somebody who's probably not in our social network, um, and and it's just really that much harder. Um, so it's it's not a real surprise to me. The other thing to remember is that young people um, have always grown up with some sort of legalization. My niece is 16, and um, she's never lived in a world where there hasn't been some legal marijuana in some US states. Um, so, you know, the idea of it of complete prohibition is just kind of um, not in their worldview. It's like um, same sex marriage to young people. They haven't lived in a world that doesn't include it. Um, okay, two more findings. Uh, seven is reverse gateway. I've been interested in this idea. So, you know, back in the 70s and 80s, substance use uh, work with adolescents really showed that folks started with tobacco, then moved on to alcohol, and then moved on to marijuana. And the longitudinal research was so precise that it was, you know, you start smoking cigarettes, six months later, you might have used alcohol, and within a year, you're highly likely to use marijuana. And that has really changed. Um, so what we're seeing increasingly is that people are initiating their substance use with marijuana. Um, and I'm, I'm terming that the reverse gateway experience uh, sequence. Um, and black youth are more likely to initiate with marijuana than white youth. Um, and that's not surprising given that white young people will probably have more access to alcohol in their homes. 
Um, but I think this reverse gateway sequence tells us that we need to rejigger our um, primary prevention programs for substance use to think about all these three drugs and how young people bounce from one to another without, you know, the historical focus on cigarettes, 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 and alcohol, 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 but rather really um, think a little more. <clears throat> Uh, do work that's more consistent with the way young people use drugs these days. And then finally, and if you forget one through seven, I hope that you'll remember number eight. And this is um, that adverse experiences and drug control policy shape risk for negative outcomes associated with drug use. And this is particularly true for Black and Latinx youth. And what I mean by that is, um, you know, a young person using marijuana in one culture um, who you know, maybe has plenty of money, has two parents who love them, um, probably won't have negative outcomes. By contrast, um, a young person who's experienced uh, parental neglect or child sexual abuse, um, who initiates marijuana use, and it's a form of coping, and um, that marijuana use happens in, in the context of suffering, that person is already on the way to uh, substance use disorder um, because they're using to alleviate uh, the symptoms of suffering rather than to feel the effects of, of euphoria. Um, so that's the adverse experiences side. And then the drug control policy, it's really about what happens to you. Who do you have to interact with? to get a drug? Um, what, what does our juvenile justice system look like? What happens when you get suspended from school? All, all of those policies that like lay the context for what the negative outcomes will be, um, that's what makes uh, uh, drug use risky at about as much as drug use you know, in and of itself. So I think we have to think really carefully about the world that we're leaving young people <clears throat> and how we do programming. Do we do programming and have blinders on to what every young person in that school is experiencing? So if your dad was deployed to Iraq and, um, you know, and you're, that's scary for you or your mom's in jail and you're with your cousins for a couple of years and, and that's something you're struggling with, you get the same exact um, program. I don't think that that is, is a recipe for success. So I think we really need to um, think about drug use with attention to the social context in which it um, occurs. Okay, so those are my lessons learned in, um, in the field. And now I just wanted to learn, just share some lessons um, that I've learned the hard way and maybe me sharing this with you means you wouldn't have to learn the hard way. Um, so one thing I'll say is that relationships are nearly as important to your success as your sciences. So you really need to cultivate working relationships even though it's sometimes hard or even if it doesn't come naturally. I think for black people and maybe other groups, you know, we have our work selves and we have our, our black communities. Um, and then we go into work and those are the work people and you have a different face on. And um, it, it just doesn't always work. So as best you can, you, you need to figure out how to um, build those relationships at work. And I'd love to talk this through a little bit more. I'll also say continue to lean on people who supported you and be that person for other people. Um, I say this to people who, um, to students who I graduated, if I'm on their capstone or their dissertation, um, always call me, like whatever you're applying for, even if you leave the field and become a zoologist, I'm still going to want to give you advice. Um, and I'm also gonna call you when I have a student come to my office who needs advice, like, and you better pick up that phone and talk to them about you know, your experience. So you gotta pay it forward. Um, it's really important to beware of asking too much of yourself. Um, I call this toxic excellence. Um, toxic excellence is actually toxic to your body. I mean, I have um, worked myself so hard that I ended up in the emergency department because I just couldn't stop crying and I was so tired. 
um, literally by 2 a.m., the physician was like, you just need to take better care of yourself um, and get a better support system. So, so don't do that. Like it really is hard um, on your body. I recommend this website called the NAP Ministry if you haven't heard of it. And she really talks about the importance of sleep, of taking naps um, and, and filling your cup. Um, so number four is something that took me a long time to figure out. And it's that there are cultural differences in why we're doing prevention science and why we're in graduate school. Um, I will talk about it in terms of black culture and white culture, but that's really simplifying it because it's not, you know, that black and white. But there's a community uh, um, that, that values ac academic excellence. That's the reason folks are going to grad school. Um, whereas what I've experienced in Black culture is that the purpose of getting your PhD is community uplift. It's helping other people. These are just real two different values. And once you recognize which value you're living and, you know, that maybe there's a mismatch between your institution and your um, own value, it just helps you get clear on, on who you're being. Um, there's a that some people experience academia as a welcoming home. This is like home for them. Their parents may have been physicians or research scientists or whatever. Um, whereas others of us see academia as an often hostile workplace. Um, and so it's important to recognize like some of your colleagues actually really love the faculty meetings. They feel at home. This is like this is this is their place. Um, um, and then, uh, I'm sorry, there's so many typos on this, but excellence as a way to measure your self-worth versus your character as a way to um, measure your self-worth. Laura Dean has a Epi Shiny People podcast, and she talks about this, that her parents didn't care if she finished um, her doctoral program. What they cared about was that she was a good person doing good things in the world. And I feel like that is also um, my value system. I remember like a time where I just, you know, got an R01 rejected and I went to this conference and it's so embarrassing going to conferences when you don't have your R01. Um, and this guy came up to me, he was Chinese and he was like, you don't remember me, but when I first came to this country, I met you at APHA and you introduced me to some people and now I'm in, um, I'm an assistant professor at Ohio State. Um, and he, he, I said he was Chinese because he literally just had just come from China um, when I met him. And he just thanked me. And when that happened, I was like, you know what? I didn't get that R01, but I'm all right with myself because I went to a random conference and I was nice to somebody who I didn't even remember. And that meant something to him. Like, I'm okay with that and I'm gonna be okay with who I am. So related to that is this idea of you need to run into your own lane. You can compare yourself to people all the time if you want, but it, it's just going to make you feel bad because there is always somebody who is, you know, just so excellent, it's, it's just tiring to even think about it. But especially as black folks and as first generation folks um, and as Latino folks, we come to the field younger with fewer social networks and often from less well-known colleges and universities. So it's going to take some time for us to um, be, you know, at the same ranks as, some, as other people. So just keep running in your lane um, and know where you are. <clears throat> when faced with people doubting your ability, remain cognizant that it's their oversight, not your ability. I had a student who was in her master's program and she told me that she was so tired of people always looking up um, questions when she uh, presented answers in her, her study group for statistics. So, you know, um, Luke says, this is how, you know, you control for something. And everyone's like, great. She says, this is how you control for someone. Everyone's like, oh, let me check that. And that is hard and it just wears you down over time. Um, and I, I think you just have to like, at that moment, it's real. I'm telling you it's real. Don't go home feeling like you're a crazy person. Did that happen? It happened. Um, and it's their stuff. 
and you um, have to um, separate their stuff from your abilities. <clears throat> Number seven, if you're left out of papers, projects, and research groups, which black folks often are, then find your people elsewhere. Um, this is really important. It's been critical for me. Um, and sometimes it's just really nice to have a group of black women I'm just working on a paper with and we can all have our bonnets on and talk the way we wanna talk and get this paper written and support each other. It's really, really um, important. So, you know, if you're, it's, it's wonderful if you're getting those invitations from people in your field. And if you're not, you do need to figure out, um, you know, why aren't people inviting you? Maybe talk to your chair or, or whatever. But in the meantime, find a group of people. And, you know, even if their research areas are a little different from yours, find something you can collaborate on because it, you just need people who you can work with and talk, and talk to. It's very affirming. Number eight is really important. It took me a long time to like get this. Recognize when you're having a trauma response and work toward not responding personally. So there is a lot of um, aggression in higher education. And it's not like, hey, I'm gonna punch you in the face aggression. It's you know, not inviting you um, somewhere or you know, not being direct about something. <clears throat> and I took that personally and over and over again. And um, that's the way academic culture works. And it's strange that it's not personal, but it's not personal, um, even though it feels personal. Um, and you have to recognize when you're having a trauma response and try to deal with it rationally rather than emotionally. I hope this is resonating. It's, it's a very difficult concept um, to respond to, but I feel like there, were, there have been times um, when I was walking around feeling just mad at everybody and it was just me having this trauma response as if I were in middle school and all the girls said they hated me um, because I didn't get invited to be on a project or something. And I needed a better way to handle this. So, you know, when things like this are happening, talk to someone who you trust and figure out a healthy way to cope with it. Um, number nine is really a root reiteration of some other things that I've said, but wherever you are, you need to make it a home. Um, you know, if you're in Nebraska um, and there's nobody like you, go beyond your institution or figure out how to make a home within your institution. I talked to a Latina woman who went to Hopkins in the 70s and she said like there was no diversity in the 70s and they had something called the third world club. And this was, you know, the, the you know, couple of black people, the couple of international students, so like one or two Latino folks, um, but they just made a community. And everybody needs people who you don't have to work to be around. So, so find those people. Um, and then finally, you'll get a lot of criticism. Honestly, put down the criticism because it's not always useful. Um, you know, if you are always getting bad course evaluations, maybe just don't read them. Like you don't need it. If you've worked hard and you stand by the decisions you've made, don't let 21 year olds saying that you weren't organized, you know, bring, bring you down. Just let it go, figure it out next time. Um, when you have a faculty review, they're always going to say you need to do more of this or more of that. Plan a nice dinner for yourself or a movie or something, but you just, there's so much criticism in academia constantly and it's important that you just take a break from it sometimes like of course when um you need to focus on it and address it address it but other times you know just let it let it go so with that i am going to um stop my sharing and just chat with you all i guess so we had a few questions and comments. Thank you so much, Renee, for that. That was really great. That was awesome. Um, and we had a, a few questions and comments in the chat box, with the first being from Alex. Um, she said, thank you so much for your talk, Dr. Jan Johnson. Do you have any advice for obtaining funding slash recognition for interdisciplinary research, especially social science, public health? I have found that social science funding agencies find health issues too sciencey and health science agencies find the social 
the social aspects to social. So do you have any advice on obtaining, you know, funding when you're interested? Yeah, I, I do think that's, there's OBSSR at NIH um, that might be of interest. And like, I would look at Russell Sage and um, RWJF, but it is a, 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 a road to toe. And I, I feel like I do social science until I talk to a sociologist or um, an anthropologist. And then I'm like, oh, wow, I do not do that. I don't even know what you're talking about. So you need to like find somebody who's also towed that line at your university. <clears throat> like maybe somebody with a joint appointment in arts and sciences and public health. Um, I, I also have a comment from Susanna. Um, just uh, saying thank you and uh, requesting for, um, you know, she would love to talk with you. And so, Renee, I will um, copy this because so she provided my information okay. to make that connection. So I can do Great. that. I see Kate uh, said something. Yeah. Thank you for your comment, Kate. Yeah, and please. I'll get in touch with the Hawaii people. Um, yeah. Leslie, hi, Leslie says, any suggestions for white faculty who, like me, are mentoring minoritized students? I want to help them to uh, establish colleagues, but without overburdening and over-servicing um, faculty college. That's a really good point. Um, I mean, I think maybe just always giving people an out, but I also, I think white faculty need to get more comfortable just talking about race. Um, I, I think often black people will mention race or this happened to me and then some white people just get stiff immediately. And, and as a black person, you know, okay, this is not somebody I can have that conversation with. They're already afraid. So I think like to ease the burden that faculty of color have, white people just have to get more comfortable. Um, and it's you're, you're going to say something wrong. Like I say things wrong um, and, and apologize. But um, <clears throat> at the same time, you know, I think we all just need to do that lift. But I am somebody who likes it when my white colleagues send me um, a researcher of color, particularly for folks in schools where they just won't, don't have any black faculty. Like, I mean, it's just needed. But always just give them it out and just say, you know, is it okay if I do this? And, um, you know, you can feel free to talk to them in six weeks or two weeks, whatever works for you. But I, I wouldn't stop doing it. <clears throat> so I love the run in your lane. Hi, yeah, I sorry, Renee, sorry. This is Karen. I can't see the chat. So I just wanted to say thank you so much. Um, this talk was amazing. And I'm definitely going to follow up with you. Sorry okay. to interrupt, but I know I can't do the chat. And I got to pick up my daughter. So sorry. <laughs> Bye, Karen. Bye. Um, yeah, the run in your own lane is so important. Like I am a faculty at Hopkins. I went to Spelman. Stacey Abrams was my college president. Like if I was comparing, and then I went did my postdoc at Harvard. If I was comparing myself to the people I was in school with, I mean, I'd literally be paralyzed in my bed all day thinking about what I haven't gotten done. Like I did not save the world today. So it's just, you know, you just gotta be be who you are and, and be proud of yourself at the end of the day. Um, otherwise, I mean, and I've actually seen this, like people who get jealous of people, it shows. And they, they put that emotional baggage on their students sometimes. Like I've seen people have students who just were amazing and, and incredibly successful and faculty kind of sabotage that instead of just letting them thrive and flourish. Um, Kathleen Herzaya, what do you think about reaching out to Black organizations to get them engaged in prevention of substance use? Um, I think that's a good idea. And I think focusing on adverse childhood experiences, trauma responsive um, approaches, and uh, drug control policy and equitable drug control policy is probably um, the key to that. But I, I think Black organizations are on board with um, prevention of substance use. I, uh, maybe they're using different words than what has been used and they're probably quite skeptical of, you know, school-based approaches that are just really education and, and fancy slogans and stuff. And rightly so, I'd agree with that, being skeptical of that. Um, 
but I say go for it. Um, can you talk more about your career development award and changing your research focus? Yeah, Natasha, thank you for that question. It was actually really hard because I was just an assistant professor and getting to a point where I had like a reputation in injury and violence and I knew, you know, the major journals and um, I, I, you know, was trained at the PhD and postdoctoral level at CDC funded injury centers and then substance use was this giant field where I didn't know people, I didn't know the conferences, I didn't know the organizations. It was um, very hard. Um, and I actually should have mentioned that a little bit more. So for those of you who are doing a K and doing that big kind of move, like maybe you've already, always studied reproductive health and now you're studying violence, um, just hang in there. It does get better, um, but you need to ask people what are the major conferences in this field. It's like you're, you know, an advanced early career scientist, but don't have that basic level of information that you that you got. Um, I always admire my students who have um, all of this like training and substance use as as, as pre docs because I, I never had any of that and I had to get up to speed really quickly. And it, I mean, it took probably eight to ten years, and now I do feel like a leader in the field and I understand. Um, but it's also given me a nice perspective because um, as in injury and violence, we focus a lot on children and adolescents. And I was always perplexed that substance use epi focused so much on, on adults when it's clearly a pediatric problem or a problem with origins in pediatrics. So I, I, am, I continue to be shocked that substance use epi um, doesn't have more of a pediatrics focus, but I think that's my injury training kind of showing through. So I think I'm um, at the hour and answered the major questions. Um, and Nicole, you can share the chat with me and I can touch base with folks. But I'd love to um, um, be in touch with you all. So feel free to get you know back to me. Um, somebody talked about work-life balance or the lack of it. I, I don't have children. Um, but I, you know, have um, aging and, and sick parents and it's really hard and I, I haven't quite figured it out. So maybe that's something we can talk about in the future. R Renee, did you want to share your email or contact information in the sure. chat folks? Yeah. Um, th this is uh, Jennifer Lewis, executive director of SPR. Thank you so much for joining us on our uh, first uh, DNC series. Thank you so much, Renee, for joining us. Really enlightening and helpful commentary. I would encourage everyone to complete the poll. We really look for your feedback. So when Miguel and Nicole and a few other DNC members develop the programming for our next three sessions, we really would like to know your feedback so we can um, uh, work that into our next programming development. So please just take a couple of minutes, just three or four questions. Thank you again for joining us.